We come back again to this Sermon on the Mount, this series through the Sermon on the Mount, sorry. We are drawing now to an end. We are in chapter 7. Today we will hear preaching from verse 13 and 14, but let's read from verse 12 to 29 of Matthew 7, and then we will focus on verse 13 and 14. This is God's word. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but a deceased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a deceased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. That is the word of the Lord. May it please him to add his blessing to its reading, its preaching, and the hearing of it. Let's pray. O oh Lord, all of us are like grass. And all our glory is like the flowers of the field. We wither and we fall, but your word abides forever. And Lord, we, because of your illuminating mercies, are those who now seek to wrap our minds and our hearts around your word. Kindly grant your blessing upon the preaching and the hearing of your word with the result, O oh Lord, that we would all in our hearts say, Oh, how we love your law. It is our meditation all day long. We please pray these things in Jesus' name. Last week we looked at Verse 12, and uh, so the golden rule, 
and uh, reminded ourselves that if we are people who pray, then we will mirror the love we receive from God to all other human beings. And we say that because the golden rule opens with uh, that conjunction, so, in verse 12. So, whatever you would want that others should do unto you, we were called to do unto them. And uh, so much can be said about that portion of scripture. Hopefully we are adding uh, obedience to our profession of belief in God's word. Hopefully now we are not leaving our pairs of socks in the middle of the floor for others to pick up after us. So on buffets behaving like there's no one coming behind us. We know better. Timekeeping is not a Western thing. It's a Christian thing. We now know better, isn't it? Because we are those who know the goodness of God to us and we seek to do good to others. Today we come to verse 13 and 14 and uh, my concern would be for us to make our calling and our election sure, to ask ourselves, are we true Christians or are we false Christians? Do we have legitimate faith or is ours a, a fake faith, a spurious faith? Verse 13 and 14 do say, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Dear friends, fake it till you make it is an English saying which suggests that by imitating things like confidence, and competence, and an optimistic mindset, a person can realize those qualities in their own real life and achieve the results that they seek. The results which they presently don't have, but which they pretend to have. And so this is a thing a number of people live with, fake it till you make it. When it comes to Christianity, fake it till you make it can be very, very, very dangerous. In this concluding section of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord is going to address us on a number of things. And the tenor here is one of caution. There is encouragement, but you, you, you receive, you, you, you sense a tenor of cautioning us. And today, especially, that is very clear. And as we look at it, I have three things I would like us to see. A command, and then a caution and a culmination or a conclusion. Jesus is saying here in verse 13 and 14 that there are two gates. One is narrow and one is broad. He says there are two kinds of roads. One is broad and therefore easy, the other is narrow, and therefore hard. Then he says, there are two destinations, one called in verse 13, destruction, and the other called life. There are two groups in verse 13, the many who are on the broad road that leads to destruction, and in verse 14, the few who find the narrow road 
which is hard and which leads to life. And he calls us to choose the road that leads to life. He opens with verse 13, telling us, enter by the narrow gate. This kind of theme is not one that is scarce in scripture. Moses presented choice to the nation of Israel. He said, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse, life and prosperity or death and destruction. You'd find that in Deuteronomy 11, 26, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. At the end of his long, faithful life, of serving God and his people, Joshua likewise challenged Israel. And he said in Joshua 24, 15, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Some Israelites were interested in pagan gods of Canaan. But Joshua concluded, As for me, and my household, we will serve the Lord. Our Savior, having delivered much of the Sermon on the Mount and the many sayings there, is bringing it now to a conclusion. He knows that many hard sayings, hard to the flesh, hard for the flesh to swallow, hard for flesh and blood to swallow, have proceeded from it from him. And so he makes it obvious to us that we are going to be faced by, with a twofold temptation. A twofold temptation that will push us towards neglecting his teaching. The temptation of the difficulty of the commands and the expectations of kingdom life that is patterned for us in the Sermon on the Mount, and the second temptation that would push us towards refusing to keep to the pattern in the Sermon on the Mount is the fact that few would uh, live according to these rules. We would feel lonely. And so he opens this section in verse 13 with a command. The command is, enter by the narrow gate. Enter by the narrow gate. Our Savior in this sermon has already made it clear what he expects of us. He knows the temptation that you are facing. The temptation to say it's too hard. And he has told us, I know it's hard. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. But now he is addressing another angle of difficulties. And he is telling us, enter. He is commanding you. He is commanding me. He is telling us, do not neglect these commands. Enter by the narrow gate. The matter at hand, dear friends, as he says, enter by the narrow gate, is clearly one of life and death. As we have seen, verse 13 culminates in death, verse 14 culminates in life. What is at stake here is good and evil. And therefore, it's a serious matter. A serious matter has been set before us as the Lord makes this command, enter by the narrow gate. This command, dear friends, is a gracious gospel invitation. It is an invitation to come to Christ and his grace and to know the embrace of God the thrice holy God in his kingdom. 
This command is an invitation to everyone. So the question must be asked, dear friend, have you personally turned to God and given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you entered by the narrow gate? The command is made not to drunks, not to people out there who are absent during this sermon. It is made to a people who are religious, a people who have been listening to the sermon, a people whom you would assume are already in the choir and don't need to be told, enter by the narrow gate. They are here listening to the sermon on the mount. And you would have been forgiven if you humanly thought that the message enter by the narrow gate should have been addressed to people other than these listeners. This is the most religious bunch of people that history has ever known. And yet they are commanded, enter by the narrow gate. The command enter presupposes something that the Bible makes abundantly clear in many other areas in Holy Writ. And that is the fact that you and me were born on the outside. We were all born in sin. Psalm 51 verse 5 clearly says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 58 verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. From the very womb, we are uh, estranged. We go astray from birth, speaking lies. We've been going through the book of Romans as Pastor Murungi has taught, and hopefully I don't need to belabor the point that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We entered this world on the outside of the kingdom of God. And therefore, being in church, coming from a Christian family, being a church leader, being a church member, being religious is not good enough. You must enter the narrow gate. Attending an afternoon service is not good enough if you do not enter by the narrow gate. And please notice the use of the article, the definite article there. That article makes it clear that there are no other entrances that you would use for you to enter into the kingdom of God. The definite article reminds us, as other portions of scripture would, that there is only one legitimate entrance into the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is that way. He says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He says in John chapter 10, verse 7 and verse 9, that I am the door. John chapter 7, John chapter 10, verse 7, he says, So Jesus said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. And then in verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He is 
the way. He is the door. The apostles in Acts 4.12 make it clear. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The apostle Paul makes it clear in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 concerning the unique, exclusive, mediatory role of the Lord Jesus Christ when he says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This gate is narrow. And it is narrow because of the exclusivity, the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ and him alone. What is in view here is sola Christus, Christ alone. It is a narrow gate. Thank God it is not a closed gate for now. At times we only look at the narrowness and forget that narrowness means passing through it is still possible. Yes, it is like going a camel going through the eye of a needle, but it is not blocked. It is a narrow gate. For you to enter, you must leave your baggage if you are going to go through the narrow, the constricted gate, you must strip down and strip away all your self-sufficiency as you enter this gate. You enter only by relying on Jesus Christ and on Jesus Christ alone. Narrowness not only demands that you strip yourself of your self-sufficiency, narrowness demands repentance. You must repent. And not just repent of sin in general, but repent of particular sins. And I say this based on Scripture. The Samaritan woman was not going to repent just about sin. She was not just being called to realize that she had walked away or she had been serially married. Married. She was at that particular time being told, there is a man you have right now and he is not your husband. The young rich ruler was not just being called upon to repent about sins in general. The Lord zooms in on his love for wealth. You must repent and believe. Believe only in the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ, his person, and his work, and rely on that alone for you to be numbered amongst those who would enter through this narrow gate. Narrowness demands that you come in one person at a time. There is no group psychology here. All the hula baloo of with eyes closed and with no eyes open, and you play around with people's psyche in a group uh, way, and all that thing that is being done today in the name of leading people to Christ, forgets that this thing is not done as a group. I'm not going to call you here in front as a group. From wherever you are, the call is upon you to enter the narrow gate. You don't enter this gate as a church, as a family. You don't come to the gate saying we are a family, we are entering. 
one person at a time. Narrowness demands that those who will enter will strip themselves of self-sufficiency, will strip themselves of clinging to darling sins. You can't go through this door while hanging on to your darling sins. Narrow gate demands that you strip yourself of a group mindset as you enter this gate. Enter the narrow gate is a command, I repeat, and it is a present imperative, which means it calls on us even today, to everyone here, it is a call to everyone that this command is one made to us today, means that if you are outside the kingdom, meaning you're already God's enemy, you have not had your sins forgiven, brought under the judgment that Christ has already received. If you, on top of that reality that you're already God's enemy, refuse to heed this command, then you are piling sin on top of sin. You are already God's enemy. He is commanding you to obey him. And you are saying, no, I won't enter. You are multiplying the sins that you have committed. To fail to obey this command is to trample underfoot the precious blood of Jesus Christ and to say, I will pay for my own sins. I have enough holiness in my bank account to take care of my own sins. I have enough collateral in my business, the equity in my holiness account is sufficient for me to take care of the righteous demand that God has upon me to be uh, perfect, Matthew 5, 48, to be perfect even as he is perfect. Dear friend, is that the case? Is that the case with you? Have you put yourself on the weighing scale of holiness on one side? And on the other side, you don't put the drunkard or the criminal or the most publicly known uh, wrongdoer in society and then say, I'm okay. If you compare me with this terrible chap, I'm okay. God will look at the two of us and give me a free pass into heaven. No, on the other side of the weighing scale is God. And you are on the other side. And his demand upon you for holiness is Mount Everest in its height. And you are a beggar, poor, who is unable to afford to ascend up that hill of holiness. And then he tells you, this is the way to deal with your bankruptcy. And you say, no. What you are telling God, and First John chapter 5, verse, I think, 12 would say, or verse 11, First John 5, 11 or 12 would say, God is saying, you are calling me a liar. So on top of the reality of your sinfulness, you are here telling God, you are making God a liar because you are refusing, you are trampling the precious blood of Jesus that was shed at his crucifixion to make this invitation here possible. To fail to obey this command is to insult the Holy Spirit of God's grace who convicts you of the fact that God is holy of the fact that you are a sinner, of the fact that there is a coming judgment that is inescapable. 
And then, having convicted you of that, he points you to Christ, who is the way, who is the gate, who is the door, who is the high tower that the righteous run to and they are safe. Are you trampling down underfoot the grace of the Holy Spirit in showing you your need to enter the gate? The command, dear friends, read it, doesn't say come close to the gate. That is not the command. The command is not know where the gate is located and marvel at the fact that you know where it is. The command is not think about the gate. The command is not hang out with people who have entered through the gate. The command is not count the people who are going through the gate. You must enter. You must enter through the gate. And the parallel text in Luke chapter 13 verse 24 says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Agonize, agonizo. Agonize to enter through the narrow gate. It requires you. It demands, dear friends, that we put ourselves in that place where we think and soul search with deep conviction and ask ourselves, have I entered through the narrow gate? Because this gate will not always be open. Now is the time to enter. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is yet near. Now is the time to enter. A time is coming. And is now nearer than when this day began in the morning. When this gate will be closed. Matthew 25 verse 10 tells us. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. This is a command that presents only two options. Obedience or disobedience. There is no demilitarized zone with regards to this command. There is no gray area. There is nothing about I'm still thinking about it. There is no fence sitting with this command. A Christian is a true Christian, is a person who has obeyed this command. A false Christian is one who thinks that he or she can have safe dealings with God based on any other ground that is apart from the free offer of the gospel that is found in Jesus Christ who says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So are you a true Christian or a false Christian? Have you entered through the narrow gate? Or have you refused to enter through the narrow gate? Secondly, a caution. The caution that we see here from our Lord tells us there are two entrances and there are two experiences. Beware. There is another gate next to the narrow gate. It is also open. 
and easy to enter into. There are those places which will have two doors next to one another or very near one another. But if you enter the wrong door, you end up in a totally different destination from the one that you initially wanted to go to. Think about the airport. Those doors may be near one another. But if you enter one that deals with domestic flights while your intention was to make an international flight, you will end up somewhere near my village instead of going where you initially intended to go. The Lord is addressing this to a most religious group of people. The, the Pharisees, the scribes, people who are following him are here. The gate is wide. The gate is big. This entrance here that he initially deals with is one that is wide and and big and easily accessible. You can't miss it even with your eyes shut. This is religion without regeneration. It is religion without new birth. It is religion without being born again. This is a kind of gate that talks about heaven without holiness. It talks about holiness without salvation. This is the gate of easy believism. This is the gate of religion without repentance. This is the gate of a Christianity that does not bear the cross. It is a gate that calls you to a path of disregarding the law of God. It costs nothing. It is that type of religion that just tells you, lift up your hand and repeat the prayer after me, sign the card, and you are instantly a church member and we will assure you that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. People enter through this entrance called the Wide Gate and the easy way thinking they are going to heaven. They only wake up in hell. And such people who enter this Wide Gate and easy way know the talk. They have the passwords. Praise the Lord! You've heard it. And yet there is no fruit that is in keeping with repentance or salvation. They know the talk. They are religious. They are stated there in verse 21. Lord, Lord, didn't they say, will they not say, we preached in your name. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. They have deceived themselves that they are hearing God speak to them. They have deceived themselves that they are working for God. And they will wake up one day to hear those painful words, irreversible in their consequence. Depart from me, for I never knew you. These self-deceived prophets and exorcists are on a path to destruction. In verse 23, we saw those painful words, I never knew you. The names of those who go through this road gate are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Sadly, very sadly, many enter by that gate. Many go through the broad gate. 
Many have gone through this road gate, this wide gate, and they are on this easy path that leads to destruction. This path is leading them towards the bowels of hell. The gate to life, dear friends, is clearly stated there as narrow. And the way is hard. And then instead of comparing those who enter it, what is the parallel there is those who find it. It's not just one you enter into with your eyes wide shut. This is one that you've got to find. The gate to life is small, it is narrow, and few find it. It requires that you break from the pack as you come to Christ. The Lord here is telling us, don't be afraid of the crowd. And don't be afraid of the challenging, the second point there is, experiences. Don't be, don't be afraid of that. In Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, the Lord says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. To acknowledge, to confess, dear friends, is more than just filling the air with words. So don't restrict yourself to that definition of confess, which limits confession to vocalizing only, filling the air with words. Acknowledging, confessing is a thing we do not just with words, and words are important, but we do it with our deeds, ultimately. Our deeds are, at the end of the day, the proof that there is a pudding. You cannot enter heaven unless Christ confesses and acknowledges you to the Father. The way for the Christian of entrance, the gate is narrow, and then the way is hard, which leads to life. Again, beautifully here, without begging the point, Scripture just puts clearly justification before sanctification. Ordinarily, a path will lead to a gate. But here we have a gate that leads to a path. And so for those who would want to say this is a call to, to um, making yourself acceptable to God because of works, they have missed the point. We started with entering through Christ before we landed on the road. So justification still comes before sanctification, even in this particular context, where we are being called to work out our salvation. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? The narrowness of the gate? The hardness of the way? The loneliness of your journey? What are we afraid of as a church? Because there is a sense in which this also does speak to us. What are we afraid of? What would push us towards being embarrassed about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who's only done us good? and cause us to backslide into that direction where we begin doing things 
that others do sinful things that churches, congregations do as they gather in the name of the Lord? Is it the hardness, the difficulty of the road? Is it that there is peer pressure and we want to look the part, we want to appear like we are with it? And so we begin twisting things. And these things need to be said because leadership changes. Today we are here. Tomorrow, who knows? We are finite as leaders. We may be out of here, gone to be with the Lord. And you, seated there, may end up being the leader here. Will this church backslide into that broad way that leads to destruction because we want to look like everyone else. How about our choices at home? As we look at the demands of the Christian faith, as husbands, wives, fathers, children, have we chosen the low road that is leading to the bowels of hell? Are we embarrassed of Christ so that we want to look vogue and fashionable and trendy by going with everyone else? Or are we like John the Baptist, the voice in the wilderness? Have we come to that place where with Paul we are saying, for to me to live is Christ. Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ. And because to live is Christ, I know to die is gain. You cannot have other rival loves and enter through this narrow gate, dear friends. Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, notice the universality. If anyone, man is exempted, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? Small gate or narrow gate leading to narrow path? Therefore, if you are on a broad path, and you call yourself a Christian. The implication, dear friend, is that you did not enter using the narrow gate. If for you, there are no commandments, there are not ten commandments. I am, I am not bound, restricted by the ten commandments. And you say, I am a Christian. You are on that broad path, calling yourself a Christian. And there is no law of God demanding you to demonstrate your salvation by keeping the commands. Then you may have deceived yourself, thinking you have entered using the narrow gate. The fact that you are on that wide path could be an indicator that you entered using the wide gate. How about doctrines? The truths of scripture. Doctrine divides. Love unites. You've had that kind of saying. Dear friends, there is nothing like that acceptable in scripture. There is nothing allowing us to have a loveless truth or, or a truthless love. Both are proscribed in scripture. We must both have love and truth. 
and it's so if for you, you are doing away with doctrines. And you're okay. And I'm a Christian. My Christianity allows me to journey towards Zion while doing away, while attritioning, while dumping the doctrines of Christianity. Then you have entered through the Broadway. Step back and enter through the narrow gate. The narrow path involves the pursuit of the glory of God. It involves a pursuit of holiness, the kind of holiness without which no man will see God. That narrow path is a path that loves the things that God loves and it is pained by the things that grieve God. And so if I am calling myself a Christian and the things that entertain me are the things that grieve God and annoy him, things that he has said no to in his word, I may call myself a Christian until the cows come back. But I am not one. This gate is as easily entered into. So be careful. Let us be careful. Peter calls us to ensure we make our salvation, our calling and election sure. We thank God that the gate is narrow. It is blocked. We thank God that it is not blocked. By his grace, and we know from Matthew 7 and verse 7, he has told us as we find these things hard, the solution is not to throw our hands in the air and give up. The solution is to ask. We will receive. To seek and we will find. To knock. The door will be open this way, this narrow way. Must be one that we get into. Self must be denied. The body must be subdued. Corruptions and sins must be mortified. Yes, even the right eye, if need be, must be put off and the right hand put off. Daily temptations must be resisted. Duties and obligations must be done, even when they are against our inclinations. We don't just pray when we feel like praying. We pray both as a delight and in obedience to the command, ask. Because that's a command. And seek is a command. And knock is a command. We don't attend prayer meetings just because today I feel like. And tomorrow I don't feel like. And therefore I don't. We do our duties even when our inclinations are not in that direction. We must endure hardness. We must wrestle. We must agonize. We must labor. We must watch in all things. We must be circumspect in our walk. We must redeem the time. We must go through, as scripture would say, even with much tribulation. The experiences of loneliness, notwithstanding, we must do this. Let's bring it to a wrap. I could say much more here, but I don't think I need to belabor this point, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the culmination, a twofold culmination. Having been told, beware, 
There is a form of godliness which denies the power thereof. Beware. Do not be one who says, Lord, Lord, and yet persists in lawlessness. Beware. If you do not put to death the deeds of the flesh, by the aid of the Holy Spirit you will die. But if by the aid of the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Having listened to the Lord there, having heard him say, the narrow gate is more than an application paper, an application form to join Trinity Baptist Church or whatever other church. The narrow gate is much more than paperwork in heaven where you are written in the Lamb's Book of Life as one whose sins are pardoned. Having been told that true Christians are not just those who have been removed from hell, and that is a very glorious thing, but they are those who are indwelt by God and therefore live holy lives. The new birth is God indwelling us, becoming our king, making us instruments of righteousness. Having been told that, the Lord encourages and at the same time warns us. He says there are two ends, destruction and life. And there is an eschatological flavor here, which is even clearer in the book of Luke, the parallel verse in Luke. Luke 13, I'll read verse 22. Onwards he says, He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And you can imagine that question. The Lord is doing ministry. And not many are truly following him. Will we remain few? Will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive, agonize, to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, now you see the eschatological reality, the end time reality. In that place, the outside, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. He is saying hell will be so painful when one from hell looks at the people inside and you know for a fact what they did to enter into the kingdom is what I refused to do. As you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets, then there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May the Lord be merciful to protect all of us who are here from that pain that will be a fruit of a false hope. If we are building a skyscraper that will grow from here to eternity, we must ensure 
we do it on a foundation that is stable. Let us not build our skyscrapers on a false foundation. The narrow path leads to the green pastures and the still waters of eternal life. Outside this narrow path, which leads to life, we can just say one is a spiritual zombie, a walking spiritual zombie. There is no life inside the rejecter of the narrow path and the hard way that leads to life. We have eternal life the moment we enter through the narrow gate. Whoever believes has eternal life. The painful, the sobering thing, the thing that calls us to attention this afternoon is out of the religious crowd, few find it. And who are these few? We saw them at the start of the Sermon on the Mount. They are the blessed who are poor in spirit. Because theirs is the kingdom of God. No one struts through the gates of heaven. You will not enter heaven showing off. We will enter heaven only if we realize our beggarly, impoverished state in light of the demands, the high and holy demands of God. And we cry out, hiding our face. We can't even lift up our face to look upon the one giving us. You know that kind of beggarliness? The one where you are so needy and so embarrassed as you ask that you can't even bring yourself to lift your face to look up as you ask. The kind of poverty of spirit that we see there in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee praying. The Pharisee came to God with a sense of self-sufficiency. I pray so often, I give so much, I fast so often. But the tax collector could not even bring himself to lift his eyes to heaven and just say, Lord, have mercy on me. And the Bible says that man, that tax collector, went home justified. Those who enter eternal life are they who mourn. Who mourn over their own sins. These are the blessed they are referred to in Matthew 5 for blessed. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn over their own sins. Those who mourn over the sins of others. They are these who are blessed. The blessed here are those who are meek. These are they who will inherit the earth. The blessed who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they are the ones who will inherit eternal life. Are you a true Christian? We thank God you came. I thank God that all of you came. But coming for this evening service is not enough. Enter by the narrow gate. And ask yourself, am I truly on the narrow way? When I look at my conduct, am I really on the narrow way? If I'm on the broad way, am I not deceiving myself that somehow I entered through a narrow gate which ended up in a broad way which will still end up in life? Are you changing God's word? Do you know better than him? 
Why would you refuse to enter by the narrow way? Because of loneliness? Surely is it not better to enter life with a few than to go to destruction with a great company? Or do you prefer it the other way? We are going to destruction, but at least we are many. Fully not. Are you saying I'm willing to go to hell because I'm not willing to lose company? I'm not willing to lose status. The Lord is very gracious to us. I don't think there is anyone who is in his senses who will say, I'm willing to go down the path that leads me to the gallows, the path that leads me to the electric chair where I will be executed because it's a smooth road. It's so pleasant. It's a highway. It's a super highway. There is no traffic jam on this road. I know it ends at the gallows, but I would rather be there because I can cruise on that road. I think, on the other hand, we would prefer to be on a rough and dirty way which leads to the palace. We would be willing to endure the rough and dirty and difficult way that attracts absurd criticism and even persecution from men. Because we know it will end in the palace. Do not wait any longer. Do not wait any longer at the gate. Enter by the narrow gate. May the prayer of our hearts, dear friends, be that of the hymn writer. Guide me, O. Oh. Thou great Jehovah, as I pilgrim through this barren land, let us be able to say with him, I am weak, but thou art mighty. Let us tell him, hold me, O God, with thy powerful hand. If we do that, then the hymn writer's words in the third stanza of that hymn would make sense to us. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside, death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side.